Anybody else have anything you'd like to share with us this morning before we get started? If not, go to Bob. Almighty oh God, we come before you today. So grateful for the, the blessings of the, the successful uh, help of both Mike Shuby and Sheriff Doherty that uh, Kerr has worked for. We thank you for that. And we can go to our loved ones that need your hand in touch. Be with us throughout this Bible and service and church service. We can learn more of your wonders, glorious ways. We thank you that your precious holy name. Amen.
they call it Acapulco. That's without music, uh, just simply because I don't know the letters, numbers, keys, and all of that sort of stuff uh, for this particular song. And I was sharing with Sister Sandy uh, last night we were talking about it. I was in probably the fifth grade. We used to do a uh, every Friday religious thing. Almost every time we would sing the national anthem, do the Pledge of Allegiance, and then pray the Lord's Prayer. And one day, uh, Mary Ann Williams, uh, it was her turn to lead devotions that morning, and she said, we're going to sing the national anthem, do the Pledge of Allegiance, and then I'm going to sing the Lord's Prayer. Mary Ann Williams had an absolutely gorgeous, wonderful, beautiful, special, great, Good, I don't know, in other words, voice. Excellent singer. And in the, she was in the fourth grade, I think, and I was in the fifth, or she was in the fifth, I was in the sixth, something like that. And uh, it was a wonderful day. But uh, just sing along with us as much as you can. Yeah. 
Okay, how are you? You may be seated. I hope you stay for lunch. It's time for a prayer request. Remember Brother Jim and Sister Sandy. Remember Brother Jerry and his health. Remember Sister Rosie. Remember Brother Randy and Sister Barb. Remember Brother Jean and Sister Judy. Remember Sister Olive. Remember Sister Nina Williams. Remember Sister Judy still needs our prayers. Remember Dave Swindler and his recovery. Remember Jenny Witt doing much better. Then the parts of remission from stage four cancer. Remember Sister Barb Burr. Remember Lori's sister Linda. Remember Sister Sandy's daughter Bo. Remember Sister Diane's grandson Alexander. Brother Chuck's friends and Cook family need our prayers. Remember Jenny's husband Larry. Remember Larry and Lee in Woodside Home in Mount Elliott. Remember Gary McLaughlin Jr. need our prayers for his wife, family, and situation. Remember Sister Bonnie Messick's daughter, Carol, has stage four cancer. Anybody else have a request? Yes, Jim, remember me. My brother is not in the tank. Anybody else? I think, like, I mean, in our family, there's a lot of them traveling. His brother's out west. But my son, Gary Jr., has, is with the family clear up in Michigan. So I'm really hoping he takes this time and enjoy being with his family and his kids and just take the downtime and enjoy it. And then with Margaret up, she is just in a lot of pain today with her feet. She's trying to get on her feet. She leaves to go to Tucson for a week and she just seems like she just struggles with everything. Anybody else? Dr. Daniel and Julie, they've been in Florida all week. They were coming home last night, and they didn't have a pilot for the plane, if you can believe that. <laughs> that Couldn't was, put it on autopilot? <laughs> so they, had, they finally got to Baltimore after midnight. They were changing planes there. So they had to go to a motel. And so they should be flying into Columbus at 12.30 today. All good. We're ready for their safety. They were coming for, for lunch today. So they won't be now. <laughs> Anybody else? If you all would pray for my cousin. He's in the hospital. They just found out he's got stage three cancer. So uh, they were going to, they did a little surgery and they seen something. So maybe we'll pray for some good treatment and healing. Anybody else? Jenny called, and she's real sick with a head cold. She had planned on coming her and her. So. Anybody else? If not, just a little bit, would you like to have a short prayer and bring these requests? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather in this church and have you blessed this.
of you fathers, all of you mothers and other entities who are not a father, let's give the fathers a hand. Yeah, you can give yourself a hand over there. I didn't. But we're glad to be here this morning. It is, of course, Father's Day. And uh, in case I forget to say it later, and in case you didn't see it, out there along the south wall of the fellowship hall on the food bench, there's food. And uh, we talked about hamburgers, we talked about hot dogs, we talked about chili, we talked about a bunch of other stuff. Somebody, I'm not sure who made the suggestion, how about sub sandwiches? We've done that before. And I like sub sandwiches, so that's what we're doing. Uh, the thing is, you get to make your There's all kinds of good stuff out there to make that thing out of it. Pile it high, pile it deep. Uh, put mayo and ketchup and Italian dressing and hot sauce and horseradish and coleslaw and everything else on it you want. Uh, get that before you leave, okay? Or, well, in my case, get that, but uh, whatever. Somebody else want to stand this morning and just praise God for something good that happened to you down through the week? Uh, or you just want to praise Him? Who wants to be first this morning? Anybody got a song? Okay, well, all hearts and minds are clear. Um, today is, of course, Father's Day, national holiday that is celebrated across the country. And uh, I started to ask prayer uh, when Brother Jim was taking the prayer request, and I decided that I would wait. Uh, there's a situation, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may have not. In Cincinnati, or at least in that area, young fella, lined up his three-year-old, five-year-old, and I think seven-year-old, or eight-year-old, three young boys and his daughter, lined them up and got a rifle and started shooting them. A little girl got away. The mother tried to stop him. She got shot in the hand. He killed all three of his sons, actually chased one of them down in the woods, brought him back, hunted him like he was squirrel hunting or something, brought him back, shot him in the front yard, laid the rifle down and sat down on the front porch waiting for the cops to come get it. Some of you think I'm going to ask you to pray for him. I can't. Pastor Dwight may be a week to be able to pray for him. If I prayed for him right now, Brother Jim, it would almost be for somebody to take a bed sheet and choke that dude right now. Because I not understand how in this world a man could shoot his own children. But what I will ask you to do is pray for that little girl. She saw her three brothers shot right in front of her eyes. And the mother, who couldn't do anything about it, they seriously need prayer. Their, the rest of their life is going to be haunted. And I think that's the right word. It's going to be haunted by the images and the things that occurred right then. And if you can, pray for that father. Pray that he gets saved. God can forgive him of what he did. And God can forget what he did. And he can go to heaven. Being the kind of person that he is, I doubt that he will. But I hope he does. And we'll just leave it at that. Today, as we talk about children, those three, actually four down in Cincinnati, there are, there are some other statistics I just want to share with you before we actually get into the message. In the United States today, there are over 18 million kids under the age of 18 who have a father, but he's not in the home. One out of four children today in the United States. And that's a really sad statistic, Brother Jim. One out of four children in the United States today either have an absentee father or have no idea who their father is. And that's the really sad one is when they go to their mother and they say, Mom, 
where's my father? And she said, I don't know. And they said, why don't you know? And she said, well, I ain't sure who he is. It's a sad commentary on what's going on in our United States today. But, and I can personally attest to what it means to not have your biological father with you. Some biological fathers are not the greatest biological fathers that ever lived. Uh, but they do, I think, sometimes the best that they know how to do. And that's, that's really sad, too, because a lot of men who are placed into the position of father didn't really have a good uh, image, mentor to look at when they, when they were growing up. So now that they're fathers, they don't have a good base to start out with. But uh, thank God that uh, those who at least come to church and at least are saved, at least read their Bible, they get some kind of a better opportunity to become a better father than those who don't. But again, today we're not here to decipher all of the statistics and so forth. Uh, we're here to uh, praise the Lord. Uh, we've come to together to recognize the fathers and the importance they are. And above all anything else, we're here today to praise our real Father. Our Father in Heaven. Uh, when I did not have my biological father at home, I had a stepdad who at times I think wish I would just leave. Uh, at the same time, I had a heavenly father who was watching over me and taking care of me. And uh, Tony didn't do the best job he could have done, but again, I give my stepfather a little bit of slack because his image that he saw growing up as a stepfather himself wasn't very good. I'm a stepson of a stepson, which really messes things up to a certain extent. But again, we're here today to praise the Lord, and we want to start out with picking up on a prophetic statement that Jesus made. But before we go to the prophetic statement, we need to see this right here. If you look at the image up there, it's in red. That means these are the words of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the Word of God. Don't get me wrong. It is the Word of God from cover to cover. The maps may be messed up, and some of the definitions in the back may be messed up, but from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, this is the Word of God. But sometimes we look at something that's a little more important, or at least has a little more uh, weight to it, and those are the words of Jesus Christ. Those are the words you find in your New Testament that are in red, and these are some of those words. He said in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, I am he that liveth, and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, most importantly for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for being our Father. When we sing that song or when we pray that prayer, we use those first two words, our Father. And we know that we get your attention when we say our Father. We thank you, Father, that you are attentive to our words, to our voices, to our prayers, and we just praise you this morning. Be with us the remainder of this service. Guide us and direct us. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. And they all said, Amen. Jesus starts this message by affirming who he is and what power he has. And he goes on to mention many other things before we get to the prophecy part. Uh, but we want to look at just one of those messages that he talked about. And ironically, when we get to the message, it's going to be part of the message to the church of Philadelphia. I don't know how many of, how many of you here have been to Philadelphia. You ain't missed a thing. 
Philadelphia is one of the dirtiest cities I have ever been in in my life. Uh, Philadelphia also has, you know, when Jesus was sending the messages to the church of Philadelphia, I'm not sure there's a church there. And that, that, that's no joke. Uh, for the time I spent in Philadelphia years ago, I did not see, of course, I have to admit I wasn't saved yet, but I did not see any evidence whatsoever of any Christian anything going on in Philadelphia. I saw a lot of sin going on in Philadelphia. I saw a bunch of sorrow going on in Philadelphia. And, you know, when I read this, when, I, when I'm reading this part of the book of Revelation, when I get to Philadelphia, I have to shake my head and say, I know, God, you didn't mean the city of Philadelphia. You were talking something else. But I always come up with the idea of Brother Jim. And he was talking to that place over there. Uh, and maybe he was to a certain extent. But at any rate, the message that Jesus, we're going to deal with here in a few minutes, was to the church of Philadelphia. It was definitely for the end times. But at the same time, there are a lot of things that are said for the end times that you can pull back and it's applicable here today. And this is what he said. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, he said, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. As we begin to decipher this promise, it deals with one central word inside. And that one central word is what? Temptation. <clears throat> temptation has been a part of the human life ever since uh, Adam and Eve were created and put in the garden. We all know about the temptation that Eve had when Satan came to her in the form of the snake and said, just have a bite of this fruit. It will make you smart. It will make you intelligent. You will have knowledge that you've never had before. The serpent told her that, look at it. It's good to eat. Look at it, how beautiful it is. And of course, she took it. And see, God told her, don't do this. Well, actually, we don't know that God told her. But God told Adam, the head of the household, God told Adam, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. And we assume that he was smart enough to tell her. Now, I admit some husbands sometimes don't share everything with their wives. But I think as important as that was, he probably shared that with her. She knew when she was talking to the serpent that she was not to eat of. Whether God told her or whether Adam told her didn't make any difference. She knew she was tempted by Satan to sin. And what did she do? She sinned. Temptation has been a part of the human life story starting right there. And a few years later, we find two brothers, Cain and Abel. Satan tempted Cain to pick up a rock and kill his brother. And Cain picked up a rock, listened to the temptation, and killed his brother. In either case, Eve or Cain, they, and I'm going to say this in a while, I want everyone to understand this without a doubt, they did not have to carry out the temptation. The temptation was thrown to them by Satan. They could have said no. But we all know that they didn't. And that brings us to the rest of the message there that is really important. And again, it's from the lips of Jesus. It's not any extra, it's just a central part of the message. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Friends, this is a promise. This promise was given to you by the Son of Almighty God, given to you by Jesus Christ, given to you to take, grab hold of, hang on to, and live with. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. We always need to remember that promise. And, you know, quite honestly, when you look at that promise, I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that when Jesus gave those words, 
God the Father was looking down at his son saying, I'm proud of my boy. I'm proud of my son. Look at the promise that he gave our people. I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. No matter what temptation ever comes your way. And again, let me say that again. No matter what temptation ever comes after you, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And we can do two things with this promise and with this knowledge. Number one, we can claim the promise. We can claim the promise that He will keep us by simply saying no to the temptation that came our way from Satan. I don't know what would have happened if Eve had said no to Satan and just folded her arms and said, no, I ain't going to do it. I don't know where that would have went. Something different in society, something different in the world would have come about if she had just said no. Something different would have come about if Cain, when he picked up the rock, would have just thrown it down. That's all we can do when, when temptation comes our way. We can look Satan in the face and say, no, I ain't going to do it. I'm not going to take drugs. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to rob. I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to cheat on my income taxes. I'm not going to shoot my neighbor's dog. There's some neighbor's dogs every now and then. They need a good shoot. Do, do a world of good for them. But uh, you got to just kind of avoid that temptation. And don't do it. We can seek, seek his help when the temptation is strong by seeking not so much Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but Jesus Christ, the Advocate. An Advocate is one who speaks for us. Anybody here ever had a lawyer do something for you? He was your Advocate. He was the one who spoke for you in the court. He was the one that spoke for you to the prosecuting attorney. He was the one that spoke for you to the police. And obviously you're here, so it all got taken care of one way or another. Lori got a phone call, oh, it's been a number of years ago now, and uh, she wasn't at home, so I took the phone call, and the phone call was all about when she was going to pay that $10,000 that she had charged, when she was going to pay that $10,000 she had charged on her credit card in New York City. I told the guy, I said, Mr. I don't know who you're talking about. My wife has never been in New York City. The nearest she's ever come is Jamestown, New York, and I was with her all that time. She did not get on the bus, go to New York City, and buy whatever that $10,000 is. Well, we know that she's the only Lori Semino we can find, so it must be her. Oh, fine. We ain't paying her. And then the phone calls kept coming and coming and coming and coming. One morning, I got a phone call from the area code in Cleveland. Ten minutes later, I got a phone call from the area code in Cincinnati. They were reading off the same script. Those words were the same, right off the same script. And then I got one from over in Indiana. I think it was Indianapolis area code. And I really do feel sorry for that black fellow. It's, it's, you know, sometimes you can tell the voice, the way it's spoken, and so forth. That poor fellow couldn't read for anything, and he was trying to read the words that were on the paper. They wanted that $10,000. I finally actually got a summons from Marion, up in Marion, Ohio, court to come in and tell us why we weren't paying the $10,000. We went to Marion and we got us an attorney. The attorney said, stay home, play golf, go fishing, mow the lawn. He said, I'll take care of it. $312 later, taken care of. He was my advocate. He was Lori's advocate. He went in and told the judge, these people don't have any evidence. These people are trying to just rip them off. These people want Dwight and Lori to just make a, an opportunity or make a, make a statement about uh, an offer 
about how much they'll pay and get this whole thing taken care of. It's not their bill. And the judge said, get out of here, go back to Cincinnati. And that was over and done with. But my advocate, and that's what we're talking about here, my advocate stood in front of the judge, talked for me, saying the words that I probably couldn't say if I'd been up there. Probably wouldn't have been a nice thing. <laughs> I, have a, I have a tendency when people mess with my honesty. You can mess with just about anything you want to. You mess with my integrity. You mess with my honesty. Uh, you might see that other side of me for a few seconds. <laughs> but uh, to make, make the long story short, the advocate took care of all of that. And Jesus Christ is our advocate. He stands there. Uh, when Satan comes to us, uh, he stands there and uh, stands between us. All we have to do is, Lord Jesus, be my advocate in this situation, whatever it is. And Jesus Christ, you know, look around. Jesus Christ has taken care of every situation that came to you in your life, as far as temptation is concerned, that made a difference. You say, now, I don't know about that, brother. What? You're here. You're safe. You got up this morning in a maybe maybe too warm house. The air conditioning wasn't working. We woke up the other day in too cold of a house. Our propane tank people forgot to fill up the propane tank. When they come back this time, they're going to fill that dude all the way up. So this all the way up. And somebody, one of them, is going to crawl down underneath the house there and light that pile of light. I didn't do it. They didn't send me my propane, so they don't have to. And I hope them spiders chase them out of there. Scare them good. There's some good spiders down in there. But we have to remember that Satan, God does not tempt anyone. God has never tempted anybody. When someone is tempted to do something that is wrong, evil, sinful, it's always Satan that does that. And uh, you've also got to remember that Satan does have an ability to get people <coughs> to think about what he wants them to do. He got one third of the angels in heaven. He talked to them. He talked one third of the angels in heaven to help him in his revolt against Almighty God. How good, how well did those one third of the angels make out? If you haven't read that part of the Bible, I'll tell you how well they made out there in hell right now. They're the demons and devils and imps of hell that come to help Satan to tempt you to do things. That's who they are. But the thing is, they will never get out of hell. We spoke about this some time ago, about the born-again experience. You have to be born first before you can be born again. You have to be born of the water of birth before you can be born of the Spirit. They were never born of the water of the birth, so they can never be born of the Spirit. All of those angels in hell can say, God the Father, I'm sorry. I wish I could repent. I didn't mean to do it. I, I was talked out of it. They can say all that they want to. They're in hell. They're going to stay in hell. Praise God. But Satan had the ability to tempt them to go his way. People are tempted to do drugs. They do them. They're tempted to rob and steal. They do it. They're tempted to do a million other things. And if you really want to see what sin is, go out there on the wall. There's a little plaque. It's got the Ten Commandments. Every sin you can think of will somehow go back to one of those Ten Commandments. I saw it someplace on the uh, computer the other day. A fella had a image there the Ten Commandments and over to the side he said we can get rid of all these 3,972 law books all over the United States if they would just, if everybody would just follow these ten little things that God wrote on a stone. Amen. And I believe that. But all of these things that they do, it's nothing more than sin. It's dirty, stinking, nasty, stupid sin. Sadly, when they fall into that temptation, they sin, and if it's not repented of, that sin will take them to hell. But thankfully, Christians have studied their Bible, heard the Word of God through preaching or through a song, and listened to the urging of the Holy Spirit. Christians have the ability to stand strong, stand above sin, send it on its ugly way through and because of Jesus Christ. 
We are not strong enough to do it on our own. And if you think you are, look at Eve. She couldn't. Look at Cain. He couldn't. Look at uh, Judas Iscariot. He couldn't. Look at the rich man Lazarus. The rich man died. Where did he wind up? He wound up in hell. I, when I read that sometimes, I, I really, oh Lord. Little Lazarus died. The angels came and took him to heaven. And right after that it says, and the rich man died and what? In hell he lifted up his eyes. He died in hell. There's no space in that scripture. It doesn't talk about him having ten years to repent or a thousand years to think about what he did or go to purgatory and someone praying out of it. None of that. It says that the rich man died and in hell he lifted up his eyes. That is the future for everyone who dies without Jesus Christ. Lastly, I want to pick on one individual. Because this This one individual breaks my heart. This one individual walked with Jesus Christ for three years. Ate off the same table with Jesus Christ. Slept on the same hillside or in the same house with Jesus Christ. Saw the miracles. Heard the preaching. Heard the teaching. Saw the wonders that he did. And sold him for the price of a slave. 30 pieces of silver. I read one time, and I, I don't know where the fellow got the information. But those same 30 pieces of silver was also the price of a special dog. How he could do that, Brother Jim, I don't know. But sadly... Even some Christians betray Jesus Christ. They fall under the temptation to do something, to do something wrong. But when we do, if we do, the wondrous part about it is right back up there. We can go to the advocate and what it says, I will keep him. Jesus will keep us. All we have to do is say, Jesus Christ, I'm sorry. And as we said earlier this morning, the young man in Cincinnati that killed his sons out in the front yard. I don't know that he will do it, but I can tell you what can happen. He can fall on his knees. He can say, Father God in heaven above, I'm sorry for what I did. Please forgive me. And God the Father in heaven above, Jesus Christ in heaven above, can both say in unison, you are forgiven. And in unison, it is forgotten. That's the wonders of being a Christian. We have that power. Should any of us fail in any way, big or small, we only need to go and ask for that forgiveness. And all will be well. You have my promise on that. You have Jesus' promise, you got my promise. That's, that's pretty good. You got to it. But uh, again, not only is it forgiven, but it's forgotten. And today on Father's Day, let us each be grateful to God for the wonderful fathers that many of us did have. And as well, be eternally glad for our Heavenly Father this morning. As Sandy comes to uh, uh, sing our invitation song, I don't know this morning if someone may have a reason to pray. Someone may have a problem in their life that they need to take care of. Someone may have something that they would like God to do on their behalf. So this morning, as Sister Sandy sings, just as I am, if you have a need, if you have a desire, if you have a prayer request you'd like to share, please come, take me by the hand, let's go to prayer. Is there one this morning?